Hello again, everyone. I want to welcome you again to our celebration of our Apple Fellows. Um, I'm so glad you could be here tonight. I'm so glad that we have this full house of people who are interested in celebrating writers and writing on our campus. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, you're in for a real treat. Um, I want to say a few words about the, the fellowship itself, um, tell you a little bit about our fellows, but then really this night is about them. So when I finish saying what I'm going to say, they're going to come on up here, and then they're going to share their stories um, with us. Um, so I should acknowledge at the start that it is thanks to a very generous contributions of CMC alumnus um, Joel Apple, who's um, very kindly here with us tonight, and his family, um, that um, <laughs> that this Apple Fellowship exists and it provides first year students with funding to support purposeful, independent, and transformative experiences. Um, and these experiences culminate in meaningful writing um, projects. And all of the planning, all of the imagination, all the curiosity that leads to these experiences and projects, these all come from the heart and from the, the sort of curious minds of these Apple Fellows. Um, our 2019 group of Apple Fellows, all 20 of them, there were 20 this year, we'll hear from 11 tonight, traveled across the United States. They traveled to Jordan, Germany, India, New Zealand, South Korea, Italy, China, and Ecuador, where they used writing as a tool for exploration and for learning throughout their experiences and then when they got back to campus. During their travels, they all overcame challenges. They will probably talk about that. Um, they learned something new about themselves, maybe many new things about themselves. They became more aware of different perspectives. They questioned and redefined their values. And they came to understand, I think, the power of storytelling as a means of connecting with others and expressing their own ideas. So tonight, as I said, we'll hear from 11 um, of the 2019 fellows. Um, before they begin, I want to acknowledge the amazing work of their faculty advisors. These are individuals, faculty and staff members, who offered guidance and support to our Apple Fellows this summer um, as they traveled and as they wrote. Um, so if you served as an Apple advisor this year, would you please stand up so we can recognize you and recognize your service? I know you're probably full of food, but please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so at this point, I want to invite our Apple Fellows up to the stage. Those of you who are presenting, this is your time to shine. Come on up. Um, and when they're done, we'll have time for a Q&A. So I hope that you're thinking about what you'd like to know um, and to learn um, from our fellows. If you can. Yes, try to sit in order. It is? Perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Futterman. Um, for my Apple project, I wanted to answer the question, what motivates people to take on the hardest physical challenges in the world? Um, I took this angle through the lens of ultra running. Um, so this summer, I went to a few different ultra marathons and interviewed the runners and basically asked them, why are you here? Uh, for those who don't know, an ultra marathon is any running race that's more than a marathon, which is 26.2 miles. So I saw races that were up to 200 kilometers because um, I went to Oceania and, and they do kilometers over there. So 200 kilometers is 125 miles and all the way down to 40 miles. 
Um, I only learned about ultras a couple years ago, and I was just fascinated by like the will of people to just keep going after a marathon. Um, so I chose to travel to New Zealand and Australia for these ultras. I chose New Zealand because I knew it was a hub for like extreme sports and athletics. I know bungee jumping was invented there, so I figured if they're crazy enough to do that, they're crazy enough to run all these miles. Um, and I chose to go to Australia because for my whole life, I've wanted to find Wallaby Way. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think the biggest turning point for me in my trip was when I was sitting in the airport going from New Zealand to Australia and I saw the gate right next to mine was headed back to the States. The flight was headed back to the States. And leading up to this point, there were just a lot of things that weren't going my way and I thought, I was exhausted, I was sick, and I just thought to myself how much easier it would be if I just hopped on that flight and went home. Uh, I didn't do that. Um, I got on my plane to Australia, I reset my mindset, I landed. Um, and the people in Australia who I was working with for the race just took care of me. It was warm. I, things started going my way again. And I found myself sitting in an interview with Mark Hope. Mark is very cool. He is a pediatric ER nurse. He's in his mid-40s. He has two kids. And I was like, Mark, why isn't a marathon enough? Like, why, why go further? And he said, you know, like, a marathon doesn't hurt enough. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, <laughs> he said, if you think about a 100-mile race, it's like an entire lifetime packed into 30 hours. And there are some really low lows, and then there are some euphoric highs, but you don't get those highs unless you push through the lows. He said a marathon isn't long enough to really get you to a place where you have to mentally dig yourself out of that hole. And coming from a point where I was at my low low and almost went home, hearing that was almost poetic because I just, it just showed me how much running is like life. Like, I go on good runs, I go on bad runs, but in the end, I'm still a better runner at the end. And it was so inspiring to hear him say that. And I got to talk to so many people, that's just one. But um, I just, the whole experience taught me so much about what it is to be mentally tough and all of those things. And I'm gonna stop talking at you guys now and show you a little bit this video um, about what I did when I wasn't interviewing the runners. Um, so, let me set this up. to get back to where it was. Oops, that's not what I want. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Good evening. Oh. Good evening. My name is Maria Gutierrez Vera and I am a sophomore. Um, today I'm going to talk about my Apple project, but I wanted to start off with a list of thank yous. Firstly, thank you to Joe Apple for making this experience just available for all of us. We're all really grateful for it. I also wanted to give a huge thank you to Professor Crockett and to my advisor, uh, Ms. Martinez, for being there throughout this entire process. And then I wanted to give a final thank you to my grandmother, who is the source of this project and who you'll be hearing about shortly. I chose to write about my grandmother, or Nana as I call her for this project. My Nana was born the youngest of four siblings, studied briefly to be a nurse, was widowed at 40 and saw both of her parents through terminal illnesses, all the while raising four kids and putting them through private schooling. She is, in short, the strongest and most loving person I believe I will ever meet. I could spend hours and hours talking about my love for her, but tonight I'll give a brief overview of her personality and her significance in my life. I was born in Mexico and lived there until I was six. 
During these years, I was in my grandmother's direct care. As I get older, I've started to realize the weight and importance of, that my Nana has had in shaping me into the person I am today, and what her own experiences reflect about our culture and our family. I've written a collection of short stories focused on my Nana's life, from her beginnings in Chihuahua, Mexico, to her life now in Hermosillo. This collection is an exploration of memory, family history, and all the ways our lives intertwine with el otro lado, the other side, meaning the United States. I hope this project honors my Nana and is at least an attempt in capturing the essence of the person she is. The title of my project, Desde el Valle de Nuevo Casas Grandes, Historias de Guadalupe, Madrid, Burgos, y Dos Vidas en Hermosillo, Sonora, speaks about my grandmother's origins and the way both of our lives intertwine and come together. This summer, I traveled home to Hermosillo, Mexico, where my Nana and my extended family lived. I spent June through August in my Nana's house, taping hours and hours worth of conversations about each and every aspect of her life. My summer was memories and stories and the promise of a childhood left behind in the red desert dust. It was boxes of old pictures, mid-morning forays into the corner store, and slow evenings spent walking along Catedral, the old church in the city square. It was learning where home was 12 years after I'd left it, and learning what it means to love and leave the household that raised you. I'll be sharing one of the stories I wrote entitled Tormentas del Verano, Summer Storms. July through August is monsoon season in Hermosillo, and much of my childhood was marked by those long, sweltering weeks spent in the humidity. The summer rains come in silently. A soft wind in the evening transforms itself into violent gusts, threatening the date palms that hang over our heads. The palms sway so violently that bunches of the fruit fall onto the roof of the house, onto cars, into the middle of the street. La tormenta, the storm, comes in through the kitchen, slamming the glass windows open, drenching our backs, and scaring away the dogs. My grandmother is there when the electricity goes out for the night. Her voice remains steady, cutting through the dampened and heavy air. She speaks of the storm she has braved, of the wooden cabin, cabin her family lived in out in Nacorichico, how the wind would whistle through the wooden planks when the storms descended, how summer always meant rain so powerful that her own grandmother would feel them countries away. She reminisces about the afternoon she would spend with her siblings playing out in the rain, watching the hills drown in water and come alive with greenery the next morning. She laughs as she remembers the men who would go out into the downpour, cursing the heavens for daring to blow across their country. These same men who would cut the storm with butcher knives, throwing the blades into the air as they finished taunting the rain. The community would gather when the rain became too much, returning to where the men had threatened the skies and in turn scattering Palm Sunday ashes into the storm with desperate pleas to end. When the electricity returns in the early morning, she is still there, combing my hair to prevent it from sticking to the back of my neck. She makes her rounds across her garden, the sweet smell of yerba buena, of spearmint, cutting across the backyard. Her famed lime tree has survived this year's rains, but will fall away with the next, doing away with 30 years of its cool shade. The house is quiet as we start the day. Only the distant crow of roosters disturbs our morning. I am six years old again. I am sitting at the kitchen table, and the only world I know is under this roof in the light of these wired windows and the humid air of last night's rains. I learned love here, in the hugs and the hand squeezes and the food that always comforted, in the morning spent working through pan dulce and café con leche. Ven aquí, corazón. Come here, sweetheart, my nana calls out. Tenemos mucho que hacer. We have lots to do. Thank you. My name is Maddie Kwon. This summer, I traveled to South Korea with my primary mission to write a children's book. Um, with my Apple project, I wanted to write a children's book about an Asian American, or with an Asian American as the main character, because when I was growing up, there weren't many books about Asian American children nor characters that I felt like I could look up to. I wanted to create a role model for other Asian American kids because I realized now that I didn't have one until I was old enough to realize that. Um, most Asian Americans are excluded from prominent media today. I chose South Korea because that's where my family is from and I wanted to explore my roots by myself. I knew that it would be challenging because I don't speak Korean, but I think that made it all better, all the better because each day I encountered a new obstacle that pushed me even further out of my comfort zone. I 
had the opportunity to take a Korean language class at Yonsei University for the first three weeks of my travels. Since I am from Utah, I didn't have many Korean American friends or other than family and family friends that live far away. One of my favorite experiences of the entire seven weeks was my first lunch with all of these Korean American and Korean Canadian students. English brought us together. Um, it was amazing to me because we connected on such a different level that I'd never really experienced before. And I was even lucky enough to meet one of my father's friends from college son. And his, his name is Cooper. Um, I had actually met him when I was a kid, but I didn't remember him because I was too young. But it was incredible to have met him all the way in Seoul. I ended up basing three of my characters off um, three of the closest friends I made at Yonsei. And Cooper is one of them. I spent so much time with them, and I, I, I was so happy about create, fostering such a different relationship in just three weeks. Another moment I cherished was when I was able to have lunch with my great aunt and uncle and my mom's cousin. They all speak excellent English because they've lived all over the world. During, during our lunch, my great uncle told me about my family history on my mom's side and my dad's side. I was. I learned that my dad's side is, a is from a village of scholars and that my mom's side is from royalty as well as scholars. My adorable great, -gram great aunt reminded me so much of my grandma and it was exciting for me to spend so much time with her. Um, now back to my Apple Fellowship. When I was first applying, I remember Professor Crockett telling us that these experiences are going to be life changing. I didn't think that writing a children's book would be life changing, but I was wrong. The process I went through was life-changing in itself. I was, the, the ability for me to meet so many other Korean American students was, I, I'm still speechless because it was just amazing to me. I feel like a changed person and I'm still very close to these people. I don't think I would have changed anything about my experience except for my most stress, stressful off, obstacle. I wanted to write this children's book and I had secured an illustrator and a potential backup, but when both told me that they wouldn't be able to, I started to spiral. Um, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't really talk to anyone about it. Um, and I had about a month before my project was due. And it ended up that somebody was able to end up do my illustrations and they turned out amazing. But during the process, I was stressed and I didn't know. Um, this experience took me out of my comfort zone in so many ways. I've never been out of the country on my own, and to make it 10 times more challenging, I didn't know the Korean alphabet nor the Korean language. I think just being in Seoul on my own taught me so much about myself, and I think even though I was anxious throughout my trip, I had such a good experience stepping out of my comfort zone and keeping an open mind to new adventures. Thank you. Ciao, mi chiamo Maddie e sono una studentessa degli Stati Uniti. Hi, my name is Maddie and I'm a student from the United States. I found that was the phrase that I used most often during my one month trip to Italy where I uh, tried to study the Calcio Storico Florentino and Il Palio di Siena, which are two very unique, very, very old sports that only happen in the Tuscan region of Italy. So. The first part of my trip, I went to Florence to study the Calcio Storico Florentino. In Calcio Storico, its literal translation is historic soccer, and it is where soccer gets its roots from. Uh, it's a very gruesome game. Not at, it's not super similar to the football that we know and has is so popular today, but um, the history is what makes this sport so special. And while I was in Florence, I really wanted to study the culture of the sport, but I found it really very difficult for me because while my Italian might sound good, it actually is not very good. <laughs> Italian 22 can only get you so far. Um, um, so because I wasn't local and because I didn't look like a local or speak like a local, I had a really hard time interviewing and asking people about what do you think about Calcio Storico Florentino? Why is it significant to you? In fact, I had a hard time speaking to anyone, period. And I found that I was very, very profoundly lonely. 
during my trip. And there were days where I would sit inside and think, should I even go outside today? Like, what's the point? I'm not going to talk to anyone. And I eventually I would get out of bed. I'd go, like, I'd st try and study the sport. But one day, towards the end of my trip in Florence, I realized that I had, I had to be stepping out of my comfort zone. I had to be putting myself in these uncomfortable positions or else I would never learn anything. And so from that moment forward, I spoke terrible Italian at everyone I ran into, the, <laughs> the worst. I cannot even imagine the things that I said to them. But you know what? They smiled and nodded. OK, good job. I, I don't understand you. Let's speak English instead. No, we're speaking really bad Italian, OK? Um, so this went on, and slowly people started actually asking me questions, asking me, why are you even here? What makes the Calcio Storico so interesting? And I would tell them why I was there, and they were like, okay, that's pretty cool. Like, you should come over later, and we can, like, talk about it. And I, that's how I started making friends. And by the time I got to Siena to study the Palio di Siena, I made my first really good friend. And his name is Massimo, and he was my 75-year-old innkeeper. <laughs> and he is my best friend in the whole wide world. We text at least once a week. And he always asks me, ciao, Maddie, come stai? Like, un braccio grande, Massimo. How are you, Maddie? A big hug. Um, and that is a relationship that I will cherish for the rest of my life. And that is really what I value so much about this Apple Fellowship. Uh, without breaking those boundaries, about, without pushing down that wall, I would have never made my amazing friend Massimo. I would never have been able to see the things in Siena that I saw without him. He took, he's a member of the city council, and I got to watch the Palio di Siena from the palace, which is this gigantic building in the middle of the piazza, which overlooks all the entire race, and only government officials are allowed in. And I got to stand on the f second floor and watch this race. And it was insane. It was, it was magical. It's a race that's been going on for hundreds of years. And it's hard to even describe the feeling. But in the end, I, d I don't even know the girl who sat in my room, that the room with the lights off going, I don't want to go outside anymore. Because this experience had such a like profound influence on who I am. I'm no longer that person. I'm a different person and I'm the b better for it. Uh. Oh, this is heavy. Hi there. Um, my name is Serena. Um, and this summer I threw hiked the John Muir Trail in California. Um, Ever since I can remember, I've had a passion and love for the outdoors. I've been camping with my family since I was an infant. And when I first heard about the Apple Fellowship, I knew that it was an incredible opportunity. And to combine my love for writing and with my enthusiasm for nature. So I, I did a whole lot of research. Um, and ultimately decided to do the John Muir Trail. Um, the John Muir Trail is a, a section of the Pacific Crest Trail, in, and it, it goes, which um, stretches between Yosemite and Mount Whitney. It goes over the Pacific, uh, excuse me, the Eastern Sierra Crest, which is when you're driving down the 395, um, it's all of those super spiky mountains on the side. That's the Eastern Sierra Crest. It's the highest mountains. Um, in California and on the PCT, um, and it's really awesome. And I, so I hiked the, it took 17 days. We through hiked from Yosemite to Mount Whitney. Um, me, my brother, and his girlfriend, Gina, um, 17 days, 220 miles. And every day I journaled about my experience in my little spiral bound notebook. Um, and it was really, awesome to be able to write and experience nature and really just disconnect and be able to not have to worry about the day-to-day -day and like the, the 
daily struggle and chaos and things like that that we go through and just really like relax and enjoy nature. But I did step out of my comfort zone a lot. Every day I felt like, oh my gosh, I can't walk another step. I ate a whole bunch of cliff bars because I almost bonked a bunch. Um, <laughs> um, I discovered I have a fear of heights and snow. Um, <laughs> well, um, <laughs> and um, at the end of my trip, I compiled all of my notes and my reflections, and I created a website. Um, it's called Serena and the Sierras, and um, I have a photo journal with all of my photos, as well as my um, a few reflections that I came up with during the trip, um, as well as after the trip. Um, and I had trouble really choosing photos for this slide um, because I took so many photos and it was so beautiful. And um, but I really wanted to uh, to talk about one of my craziest days on the trail. Um, so that picture that looks like I'm in like an Arctic tundra zone, um, that's Muir Pass, which is in the middle of the John Muir Trail. It's about 12,000 feet, um, and there were four miles of snow fields, and we had, we woke up a little bit too late to climb a mountain pass, and we started going, and about 10 a.m. in the morning, it started hailing, and just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, we reached a whole bunch of, um, a whole bunch of snow, and we had to, we trudged through, and we got to the top, and we were super excited, and I was, I, I felt super, like, sense of achievement, and then we started going down, and it was even worse. And um, <laughs> there's this, um, usually the trail is all the way covered in snow, or not. But this time, um, the snow bridge that you used to cross this river had collapsed. So the only way to get down from this pass was to walk on this icy boot track um, about 100 feet up from the, uh, from the mountain. And I have never been that scared in my life, and I really had to pull it together. And um, yeah, that, that was one of the scariest moments of my life. And I think just like every day on the trail really challenged me and pushed me. And I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to step out of my comfort zone, um, literally and figuratively, um, and be intellectually stimulated and excited by what I was writing and what I was seeing. And I, I'm just so happy for this opportunity. Um, I'd, I want to thank my advisor, um, Nick Warner. He can't be here, but uh, he was really supportive of me this whole time. I came into his office at the beginning of last semester, and uh, I was on crutches, and I was like, I want to walk 220 miles. And he was like, heck yeah. Um, <laughs> um, as well as my parents and Ian and Gina, my hiking partners, and. Uh, brother and uh, <laughs> and uh, all my friends and so yeah thank you hi everybody um, I'm Daenerys Pineda and before I start I also briefly want to do some thank yous first of all thank you to my faculty advisor professor Wyman um, because I never would have applied to the Apple Fellowship without her promise of reference. And thank you to the Apple Committee and to Joel Apple, because I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I really can't emphasize that I wouldn't have done this without their support, without this opportunity, um, and really without their faith in me. But um, my parents came to America from the Philippines in 1995, and they ended up in the Bay Area. I was born in 1999. And while a lot of other recently arrived Filipino immigrants often band together um, and form little Filipino communities, um, they're also known as like Pinoy's, um, my parents ended up ditching that community around 2006. And so there's a couple of consequences to this. The first is that I really can't speak the Galog, which is my parents' native language. And the second one is, is that I barely know any other Filipino Americans who are my age. So when I end up at birthday parties or graduation parties that my parents go to because they're the, the few remaining Filipino friends that they want to talk to, I often very easily feel left out. I just can't connect to them as easily as they do with each other. I feel almost like 
I'm a fake Filipino. And that kind of sense of being an imposter is really what I, why I wanted to do this project. I found myself wanting to reclaim that Filipino-American identity. And I want to note that this is still very much an ongoing process for me. So even now that I've done this, I'm not like, oh my gosh, I'm the most Filipino ever. But it's still something that I'm working through, right? Um, but it has really helped me significantly with understanding the history and the literature of Pinoy's that came before me. Delving into the work of Filipino-American authors and professors really felt like diving into another world, one that I really hadn't thought about or even had known had existed before I did this. And the world, that world really opened up for me when I started hopping around the Bay Area, um, talking to other Pinoy's, and then eventually writing short stories and essays that featured the Filipino-American community. And I think the best moment for me here was visiting the Filipino-American National Historical Society Museum. It's also known as the Fons Museum, which is much, much easier to say. Um, and it's the only Filipino-American historical museum in the nation. And so I ended up talking to two elderly women called the Juanita sisters. So they were Filipino Americans who were born here. They worked in the Stockton fields when they were young, learned nursing, became teachers, and they were really deeply steeped into the history of Stockton's Pinoy community. And like me, they were daughters of immigrants as well. And when they learned about this similarity, they said, oh, you're the bridge generation too. And in that moment, I felt incredibly honored because Historically, when we talk about the bridge generation, that refers to the children of immigrants who came over in the early 1900s. And as I said before, my parents came over mid-1990s. And so I definitely didn't consider myself a part of that history. But the Juanita sisters happily lumped me in with them. And to them, I was a part of something. And that was really a feeling that I'd like to keep. And so I'm just gonna end by talking about my slide up here. I don't know how well you can see the photos, but these are both ones that I took over the course of this project. The first one is from the Fonz Museum. It's a picture of a group of Filipino farm workers in the field. It's actually from an exhibit about um, farm workers who worked in Delano, if you know Cesar Chavez. These are the workers who um, united to basically um, get better pay, get better working conditions. Um, yeah, in, during around the 1970 Delano grape strike. And over on the right, I have a photo of the Pistahan Parade in San Francisco. It's an annual parade um, that, that re really features Filipino heritage. Um, and so I'm really lucky that I got to both see the parade and go to Pistahan and see, and see the food, see the artwork, all that really good stuff. And a lot of Filipino-American works have titles that play on a classic memoir called America's in the Heart, um, which details Filipino-American life during the 1930s and 1940s. And there's this, and it was much, much different for Filipino-Americans back then. Um, they worked really menial jobs, they experienced a lot of discrimination, but its author, the author of America's in the Heart, Heart Carlos Pulosan, had hope for himself, for other Filipino-Americans, and also for America. And he ended up writing that his faith in this country was something that grew out of the sacrifices and the loneliness of my friends, of my brothers in America and my family in the Philippines, something that grew out of our desire to know America and to become part of her great tradition and to contribute something toward her final fulfillment. I think that sums up beautifully what the Filipino American community tried to do then and is really still trying to do now. Thank you. Oh no, <laughs> so great. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Courtney. Um, so for my Apple project, I went to India, China, and a conference in Atlanta, Georgia. So what I wanted to do was kind of trace the economic pillars of the international hair trade. So in India, I focused on sourcing, China was exporting, and then the US was importing. Um, so in India, I went to a small village called Varanasi. Um, while I was there, I had two tour guides, one to show me around the city and then one to show me around like the religious ghats that are right along the side of the Ganges River. 
Um, so there I was trying to get footage of women undergoing a tonsuring ceremony, which is basically where they shave their heads in religious sacrifice to kind of get good fortune for themselves and their families. But I actually went to the wrong city, so there wasn't a ton of that. It was mostly men there, um, but I learned that in, in different cities along the river, there are women that do that, and I got a few clips. I found one woman at the end of the day after five days of her shaving her head. Um, and then in China, I went to Guangzhou to meet with a wholesaler. So while in India, it's more religiously based, in China, it's more for money. So women donate their hair to get money to feed themselves and their families. Um, so this guy, he gets contracts and just makes circular rounds to the different villages in Southeast China and things like that. And then in Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia I went to the Bronner Brothers International Hair Show. So it's... The Bronner Brothers is like a black-owned hair care business. They've been, along f been around for a long time. Um, and so they invite a bunch of, bunch of vendors to this three-day conference. There's classes during the day, and then during the evening there's events, and you can go to the exhibition hall. So they sell like styling tools, products, and they have a whole wing just for hair extensions. So there's just like piles and piles of hair on the tables. And so there's vendors from China and India, and then there are a few like American women selling their hair. Um, so the hardest part for me was the logistics of traveling. I almost got stuck in both India and China, but I survived, I'm here. <laughs> um, and also India was really, really hot. Like if you know me, just know I get hot anyway, but it just felt like 20 degrees hotter there. Um, but I also survived that. And then, <laughs> um, I think the best part for me was just going to the hair show and being around people that have all grown up with the same experience of you of like getting your hair done for five hours and spending a bunch of money on hair and then maybe not liking it at the end but just leaving anyway because you don't want to say you hate it. And so I understand why people go to like Comic Con and Sneaker Con because there's just like everyone around you, they understand why you're there and they understand why you love it so much without you even having to say it. So I had an amazing time there even though I was by myself, it was so, so cool. And so when I came back, I actually started a small hair company. Like I run it out of my dorm room, it's that small. Um, but I really learned about what it means to be ethical. And there's a difference between what a consumer thinks is ethical and what the donor or the producer thinks is ethical because to them, it's not, they're not doing it for the purpose of you getting it. They're doing it for the purpose of like bettering their lives. And I think it's wrong that well, not wrong, but I just think it's a disservice that a lot of people buy things without knowing where it comes from. So that really opened my eyes to like thinking about where my food comes from, where my clothes come from, and, like hair products and things like that. Um, I also kind of triggered my inno innovative entrepreneurial spirit doing that. So it kind of changed my like academic path and what kind of clubs I've applied to since coming back to school. And I definitely think this project has changed the trajectory of like what I want to do after school, and I think it was a really, really good experience. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Hey, y'all, my name is Tulawani. I spent my summer exploring mysticism and traditional spiritual practices in indigenous Ecuador for two months. And where I decided to go, was in Gacha. It's about 4,000 meters above the ocean in the mountains. It's a very beautiful place, and it gives me a lovely view of Riobamba, the city just nearby. And Riobamba is actually six hours south of where I spent my gap year in Ecuador as well, and that's why I decided to return to that place to explore and reimmerse myself into a culture that I was already familiar with and further explore my own spiritual development in understanding the indigenous relationship with the earth and my own. When I arrived, however, I learned that the place that I chose is actually very Christian, very indigenous, very indigenous, yes, but um, very Christian and they had actually dismissed um, their history and tradition of personifying earth and the sun and the mountains and worshiping them and instead focus on our more Western understandings of Christianity in their culture. And so rather than interview people on their spiritual relationship with the earth, I interviewed them on their non-spiritual relationship with the earth. And I was living in what you can see there in the photo, in Pucaratambo, which is 
a cultural and touristic center, and just a few minutes away are a bunch of other small indigenous communities that make one parroquia in the campo. It's all a very rural area. And so the first day for my interview, it was with Gardamen, her name is. She's 26 years old, and she lives in Kaunyag in a community with friends, but mostly her family, her mother, her father, her five other siblings, and their kids and her kids, so very intimate. And on that first day, we had a very surprisingly long walk from her home to the field that, well, her mom actually owns acres and acres of land, so in a way they're rich, but the politics of Ecuador make them poor. Um, it's kind of ironic how that works. But during our pretty long, probably 10 minute walk from her house to, <laughs> it was it was hot. <laughs> from um, her house to the alfalfa fields, which is the plant that they harvest and grow to feed their guinea pigs. I shyly asked her about her romantic life, about her daily life and what she likes to do for fun. And so in her broken Spanish or, um, and in my pretty good Spanish, we were able to communicate with each other. She told me and I learned that they grow corn and quinoa and other herbs to eat and grow with their family and they feed twice a day pigs and donkeys and guinea pigs to sell once or twice a month for money for the things that they can't grow, like rice and medicine and all of those things. Um, and at 16 years old, she also told me that her mother, it's actually a great story, but I won't go into too much detail. Her mother forced her to learn how to weave this beautiful thing called a faja. And I wish I had a photo of it, but I don't. Um, but the way that I can describe it is as a waistband that indigenous women wear around their waist. Most indigenous women, those who dress traditionally, which is most of them, um, wear around their waist to hold their skirt up. And she spends two days making one of those. It's a very complex process, and I tried to learn it, I couldn't, but she was very sweet for trying to teach me. And she sells those for $20, and that, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it goes a long way in Ecuador. They use American money, and she uses that money as well when she doesn't have um, the resources that they need, and it goes a long way. And I'll transition over a little bit more to understanding my own spiritual development during my summer experience, even though I wasn't in the right place for understanding the indigenous traditional relationship with Earth, I was definitely in the right place to learn about my own relationship with Earth. And so for two weeks during my two month experience, I was traveling between Bucaratambo and Kaunyag to work with them every day and help them carry food to the pigs, stuff like that. And while we worked together, we talked. And when there were moments of silence, I used those moments to connect the physical act of toiling with the earth to spiritual work. And so I talk about this in more detail in one of the many essays that I wrote this past summer called Malas Yerbas. I also wrote poems and took photos and did photo journaling and all of that is now compiled into what I guess I could call a zine. Um, that is currently in print and will be here. So if you're interested, let me know. It's called Find Your Mother. And in that essay specifically, I talk about what it means to connect the physical and the spiritual of Earth. And so when I was working with Gardamen and working with her other family members, when I was uprooting weeds, I would visualize also uprooting weeds like, let me backtrack. Malas hierbas, if you don't know Spanish, means bad herbs. And we can also think of bad herbs as bad habits, people in your life who suck you dry and give you nothing in return, right? And so when I was uprooting weeds, I would visualize uprooting negative relationships and I would visualize uprooting bad habits and bad people in my life. And when I was working with them and sowing seeds, I would visualize sowing good habits, sowing self-love, sowing self-care into my life, sowing honesty and openness. And while I didn't talk to Carmen or any of my other Ecuadorian friends about this self-development, they helped me to develop this practice and develop this habit of what I would call magic, but if you don't believe that or don't understand it, it's what we can call self-care and self-development. 
turning any act into a meditative experience and really growing from that and channeling your energy into that and developing that. Um, so I also want to mimic my Apple Fellows and thank my Apple advisor, Professor Smith, and also Professor Crockett and Joel Apple for making this experience possible. And because of my own personal initiative and also because of the amazing relationships that I developed with people in Ecuador, I became true, I stayed true to my mission for my own personal spiritual development and also learned about what it's like to live with the earth physically and spiritually. Thank you. Okay, hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, my name is Dorcas and I am originally from New York and this summer for my Apple pro project, I focused on Muslim Americans and their just like their experiences in America. So I went around to about six, yeah, six different states. So I went to Chicago, New York, New Jersey, Texas, Arizona, and California, interviewing Muslim Americans about their experience. Initially, I started out my project wanting to disprove this author who wrote a book called Muslim Cool, Race, Religion, and Hip Hop in the US. And I felt like doing her book, which we read in my actual, my faculty advisors, class called Pop Culture and Gender in the Middle East, which I took my fall semester, and I wanted to disprove some of the things she wrote. She did. A, she had a lot of generali generalizations, and she basically just let, like summed Muslims up into one like category and said like every Muslim across the United States is experiencing the same thing. Yet her, all the interviews that she conducted occurred in Chicago, and I felt like that shouldn't happen, like these are generalizations, like people, no matter what, experience different things wherever they are, like just by living in Claremont versus living in New York, you're experiencing a very different world. And so I went wanting to disprove that and saying, no, this is wrong. The people live very different lives and people experience very different experiences, even if they are like practicing the same religion. So initially I wanted to focus on black Muslim Americans because that was the demographic that she focused on. And I chose to go to Chicago so that I could create as much of a parallel between her project and my project so I could have a lot of a basis for comparison between what she did and what I was doing. But when I got to Chicago, I found it incredibly difficult to get interviews. So I was in Chicago for three weeks and in my three weeks there, I got four interviews and I emailed over 15 different mosques, and till this day, like literally no mosque has sent me an email in response. So it was incredibly difficult for me to get interviews, and that was a very like upsetting part of my trip. I remember emailing like Professor Crockett and like my Apple advisor, Professor Ferguson, and saying, I don't know what to do. Like I have four interviews, I've been here for three weeks. This does not seem like this is going great. And I, I was just really scared, honestly. I was scared that I was gonna be spending 12 weeks traveling across the US and I would only end up with like five interviews and like just would not have a great project to turn in. But honestly, the power of networking came in. So like all those like CMC lessons of like networking and like, you know, using your resources that really ended up coming in for me. So to get my first interview actually, my mom called like a close friend of hers that like hadn't seen me since I was like two years old. And she was like, oh, I know this person in Chicago. And then the person in Chicago knew someone else. And like, that's how I got my first set of interviews. And that interview ended up lasting over an hour and a half. And I spoke to 20 different people. And like that like was the first set of interviews that I did. And it was incredible. But then at the same time, while I was having this one incredible interview, I was having like 10 terrible interviews where like people would only give me like a minute of their time or and I would only be able to ask like one question. And questions I asked include like, oh, what does being Muslim mean to you? Like, how do you use your race to construct your identity as a Muslim? Questions like that, because I really wanted to see how race was a parallel with religion and how the, situ like the society and community you lived in deferred from your experiences across the US. And I actually chose the places I visited based on the states that had the highest Muslim populations. Well, besides like Chicago, just because Chicago was my basis of comparison. 
but everywhere else. So New York is, I mean, not New York, New Jersey is actually the state with the highest Muslim population in the US, which is why I went there, even though like New Jersey is like this big. But um, so I went there and also another like struggle I had was that a lot of my interviews became really predictable. So like I would talk to someone and they'd be like, Islam is a religion of peace. And I'm like, okay, yes but I've heard this a thousand times now, can you like tell me something deeper? So I think it was really hard connecting with people and personally I'm Christian, but my family is half Christian, half Muslim because I was raised in Nigeria. So like my family is pretty divided between both. So it was hard finding that like basis of like connection and being able to like open up because I can't connect when I'm not practicing the same religion. So that was really difficult, but Finally, again, through the power of networking, I was able to get like really incredible interviews. One of my favorite interviews was actually here in Claremont where I sat at the coffee bean and I interviewed this couple from Laverne and they came and we talked for like two hours and we're just like chatting and the they're a newly married couple and the wife was um, a Mexican American convert and the husband was a Pakistani American that like whose family like grew up Muslim and we talked about like the different experiences that they had and the wife talked about how like wearing her wearing her hijab and like feeling comfortable at times and not feeling comfortable at times and like feeling left out even though like she was being brought into this community that claimed to be like a religion of peace and like feeling like people weren't welcoming her with open arms and like it was just really interesting hearing like so many different um, points of views and like whether or not it was from people who were born into the religion, people who converted into the religion, or even just people who like just had a genuine interest for the religion or people who were like imams of the mosque. So that was really like empowering and like, well, I guess empowering isn't the word, but that was really like just, I don't even know what the word is, but it was, yeah, and powerful. Yeah, that's the word. And um, so fine, yeah, definitely my, biggest challenge would have been finding interviews. And it got to a point like where finding interviews are so difficult that I would like stand in front of a mosque and just be like, someone interview with me, please. Like even if you're just gonna answer one question, please interview with me. But you know, it all worked out well. Like at the end I got about 24 interviews. And so I had over like seven hours of interviews that I got to record. I had some interviews that I also conducted that they weren't comfortable with me recording, but it was still like inter an interview nonetheless. So yeah, so thank you so much. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you so much. And I would like to thank my, I, Professor Crockett, Professor Ferguson and Joe Apple, thank you so much. I had an incredible experience and it really opened me up to, like it forced me to like step outside of myself and be like, hey, even though I'm not a person that like typically just stands up to anyone and be like, hey, can you interview with me? It really forced me out of my comfort zone and I really appreciate that experience. Hi, my name is Laura Vences and I'm originally from Santa Barbara, California. For my Apple project, I wanted to examine the intersection between immigration, labor, and the Latino community with my main goal being to listen to the stories of people who often are the subject of one of the U.S.'s most controversial debates, and yet whose voices I at least feel are often ignored or silenced. My project was inspired by my dad, a gardener, who I would often go to work with growing up. It was in those weekends and summers I spent with him where I grew to understand that there was a complexity behind the relationship he held with his job. While he tended and cared deeply for the gardens he worked, the physical and mental demands of his everyday were draining, and yet he did it all for a larger purpose, his family. So in an effort to further understand the complexities behind the relationships between other Latino immigrants and their jobs, as well as other factors affecting their experience, I set out to Hawaii, California, New York City, and Chicago with the hopes of finding a diverse set of people living in different parts of the country. What was <laughs> What resulted was a short story I titled The Seated Generation, a tribute to the generation before mine who showed, who sowed, excuse me, who sowed themselves into a foreign soil, often leaving parts of themselves hidden so that my generation could have the opportunity to blossom. I retell the stories of seven people, my dad, Martha, a housekeeper, 
Ana, Francisco, a paletera or a popsicle vendor, and Artemio. So I never expected my project to be easy. I knew I would run into resistance from the Latino immigrant community as conversations about immigration status and experiences are often ones that are wished to be um, hidden or even forgotten. I also knew the political climate would likely affect and limit my work. However, what I couldn't have foreseen was an announcement by the president on July 12th. Two days after I arrived in New York City, President Donald Trump announced mass ICE raids targeting 2,000 people across 10 US cities, one of them being New York City. At that point, the number of people willing to talk to me became almost non-existent. So the weekend before I was set to leave the city, I decided to walk the streets of East Harlem, hoping to find someone who would be willing to talk to me. Luckily enough, I ran into a man selling waters on the street. I gave him my whole spiel about my project, and at the end, he pulled out a flyer for a meeting um, and told me to go there because I would definitely find a lot of people to talk to. The flyer was titled, What to do in case of an ice raid at home or at work. 30 minutes later, I was at that meeting, which ended up lasting three hours. And luckily, a couple of friends came with me. Um, but at the end, as people were leaving, I approached the woman who was sitting with her daughter. Her name was Anna. And, as she, agreed, and she agreed to meet with me in Central Park a couple days later. My conversation with Anna was especially meaningful. Perhaps it was because she had come at a point where I had nearly given up, or perhaps it was because she reminded me so much of my mom, but ultimately, I knew I had met someone truly special. Here's a little bit of what I wrote about her. Los Tigres del Norte continue to tell the stories of immigrants in their song, Tres Veces Mojado, or Three Times a Wetback. The song is a tribute to those undocumented immigrants from, from Central America, specifically from El Salvador and Honduras, who must cross three distinct borders in their journey north. In Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States, with no proper documentation, they exist as wetbacks three times over, rejected along the way by the elements and even the people with whom they share a pigment and tongue. Anna spoke to me again of the light, the light that grew brighter after every border she crossed, the one God had used to illuminate her path, the path had been treacherous, but the light had never gone dark, and as we sat on the bench in Central Park, she told me that she felt she had reached that light. And I wonder now if Anna knew that that light had become a part of her, a visible layer of radiance coating her brown skin. Anna, tres veces mojada, the memory of the river water that once soaked her body still existing within. But in this foreign soil, Anna had provided for her daughter everything she could cultivated for her an opportunity, and now Anna got to watch as her daughter bloomed. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kim Zmar Delgado. I'm from Prescott, Arizona, but originally from Culiacán, Mexico. So the idea for my project goes back to how I was raised in my family and my community in Arizona. There, the main form of entertainment is outdoor activities. However, after coming to CMC, I quickly noticed the lack of enthusiasm in outdoor spaces within the POC community. Because of this, I have not been able to embrace this part of me as much here as I do back home. Therefore, for my Apple Fellowship, I wanted to research a few overarching questions. One, what does it mean to belong somewhere? Two, what figurative and literal barriers exist in the supposed borderless outdoors? Three. What groups of individuals are being left out from this experience? There are multiple borders barring the entry to further exploration for certain groups. So the next question is, how do we get these people in? When I first started this project, I believed nature has no barriers. Nature gives me a sense of belonging because the outdoors doesn't judge your background. After the project, I found several exceptions to the statement, nature has no barriers. The purpose of this project was to discover the truth behind diversity in the outdoors, and I decided to accomplish this by traveling to 12 U.S. national parks where even international visitors um, traveled to. I divided this trip up into two different parts, one in June and the other in July. 
For the first part of my research, which is pictured here, um, I traveled to eight parks in 14 days. Those parks were in the following order. Grand Canyon, Rocky Mountain, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Sequoia, and Death Valley. The second part of my trip, I traveled to six parks in 10 days, and those were Bryce Canyon, Zion, Joshua Tree, Redwood, Crater Lake, and Mount Rainier. Once at the park, I would interview staff and visitors about their experience in national parks and the outdoor culture. One of my writings titled, The Diversity Talk, elaborates on how some interviewees would freeze up when they heard the words minority and struggle in the same sentence. It's hard for some people to have these conversations, but I wanted them to know the significance of having these talks. To get an idea of the, in uh, of the interview, consider the following questions. How can national parks engage communities who haven't been historically felt in the outdoors? And in your opinion, what is the purpose of national parks? In the park staff interviews, I truly tested political correctness and controversial issues. Some staff would even say, I don't think I'm allowed to speak on this. But luckily, some individuals spoke out against the inequitable ways of the National Park Service. In the end, I learned that the barriers that keep some individuals from the outdoors were the following. Financial constraints, inadequate knowledge, fear of the unknown, limited resources, geographical location, lack of media and leadership representation, and culture. These patterns repeated and re-emphasized themselves to the point where the issues were clearly seen in every park. Yosemite and Yellowstone were particularly meaningful to me because they taught me the most lessons. I learned that not all truths and issues are explicitly discussed despite their importance, or how well-intentioned actions could mean one thing to one person, but to the other person, it's a verbal attack on something that they're not even aware of. The individuals I interviewed taught me that feeling small, feeling grateful, and feeling different comes along with the outdoor experience. So, through photographs, souvenirs, newspaper sections, interview stories, and creative writings, I created a 22-page design of the Yellowstone and Ye uh, Yosemite interviews and my discoveries. To me and my advisor's surprise, my writing was 60 pages long, 12-point font, Times New Roman, and single-spaced. These findings are meant to educate, encourage, and inspire people to take initiative and explore the magnificent wilderness. Thank you guys so much for attending tonight's talk and for allowing us all to speak on our adventures. And of course, muchas gracias to my family who let me head out that day without my 14-year-old brother as my chaperone. Thank you guys. So if you have any questions for any of our Apple Fellows, please raise your hand and we'll walk a mic over to you. Hi, my name is Kirill. Um, Serena, I had a question for you. Um, <laughs> Why did you choose to hike the John Muir Trail? Thanks. Well, <laughs> great question. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. Um, well, I absolutely love Yosemite. Um, and I have been to Kings Canyon and Sequoia, which are the other parks that the John Muir Trail goes through um, a few times before. Um, but well, one time each before. Um, but the John Muir Trail is typically known as like the most beautiful section of the PCT, which I know it's like apples and oranges. You can't compare different parts of nature, but um, I wanted to experience it and see it. And I had been to Yosemite before and just watched people come off the trail and just had these epic stories about their experience. And I just, really wanted to go there. And um, I was also, I went to an ATH talk last semester um, by Liz Thomas, and she talked about hiking the PCT and just how incredible it was. And I was super inspired, and um, I wanted to do a little chunk of it myself. Thanks. Can I 
ask you all a question. So in the past, many of our Apple Fellows, who some of whom are in the room, have said that they set out on their adventures with this firm idea of what they were going to produce in terms of their writing, and something else happened along the way. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you for whom that was the case, that you had a really clear idea of what you wanted to bring back to campus and share out, um, but that idea had to change, inevitably had to change. And what was that like, having to make that realization? So I initially was going to write um, a couple newspaper articles about the impacts of the two Italian sports that I studied on the culture of the cities that I was in. And um, then, as I said, I got really, really lonely. And I, that was something that I wanted to convey in some way in my project. And it, I ended up writing a collection of 10 letters that are about 40 pages now. <laughs> and because it needed that personal kind of touch to it. It needed a less objective viewpoint. And when I realized that, I kind of freaked out a little bit. And I emailed Professor Crockett. And I was like, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm so lonely. <laughs> but I mean, I've, it, it, the idea of the collection of letters was definitely inspired by Pliny's letters, if any of you guys are like into classics, it seemed right that I should be copying an Italian author in Italy who's writing letters. It seemed like a natural fit. <laughs> Okay, so for me, initially, I wanted to do kind of like, do you guys follow like Humans of New York, that page on like Instagram? So I initially wanted to do something like that, but like much longer based on each interview. And I wanted to then like expand that into like a series of essay on each person. But after going like conducting interviews that were like either like over an hour long or con conducting interviews that were like two minutes long, I found that it would be like nearly impossible to stick to that because then some interviews I would only have like two sentences for and then some interviews I would have like 40 pages worth of stuff. And um, so at the end, I ended up just writing kind of like an article, a very long article on like my experiences. And I also found it, diff like I didn't want to impose my own like perspective on like what they were telling me because part of my project was sharing their stories and sharing the experiences of like these Muslim Americans. So I just ended up saying, okay, here's what I learned from my perspective, but here this is not reflective of each individual person, if that makes sense. So that's what I did. Um, so originally, I was talking to my table a little bit about this, but originally my um, desire was to write um, or to solely be kind of a story collector to let um, in a way these people I was I was finding tell their own story um, and have it heard by other and have it read by other people um, but I think what everyone here can agree with is that the reflection piece to this project is so important and I found that I as I was interviewing um, these people um, there was so much that I was experiencing and there was so much that um, they weren't telling me in like s straight up, I guess. Um, so much that uh, they were either saying through their body language or they were saying through, um, through like little quirky statements um, where I realized that um, the best way to um, write this was as, as a sort of tribute and, and recognizing that um, this was um, this was like m part of my reflection was um, was also um, going to end up honoring um, these people who at the end of the day meant so much to me um, and who um, I mean will will always hold a very special place in my heart so um, I think that's where my shift was in allowing myself to also be a part of this project and um, and along with them so 
Yeah, I was gonna say like I also had more of the storytelling component that I wanted to do mainly for like the visitors. Uh, but what I found as I was uncovering several truths um, behind uh, the whole national park ideal, uh, I f took on a more like activist or like a uh, kind of approach to it, um, and it became something a lot bigger than I thought it would be. Because the people that I was meeting were like incredible people that were really in the effort of trying to diversify the outdoors. Um, so I never would have expected that opportunity, like going into it. Um, so I think that was something that was pretty different. Um, I have one more Apple fellow here who's willing to, to say a little bit about this. So. Um, sometimes you also have to be ready for disaster. I mean, st stuff happens and you can't really. Uh, you know, I'm an Apple fellow, we'll present in spring, but I was in Jordan and I was in the desert, I was collecting data and collecting stories among the undocumented uh, Syrian migrants that are in the desert. And so a lot of it was was rather, you know, you, you get yourself in a little bit of ske some sketchy situations. Um, and like some of my data started to like talk about, uh, it started to sort of prove that a lot of the charities were frauds. And then I started getting like some some threats and stuff, so I had to like drop a lot of my data because they were like telling me like, oh, you, you're going to leave that here, or you know, you're not going to leave, uh, and, <laughs> and and so, so and so I had to sort of also leave a lot of the stories, and then also along the way, I dropped. I was going to make music as well from some of the stories as well as the data, and I like lost my phone with all my voice recordings, and I did. I I learned on the way that voice recordings don't back up. It are not including in the included in the standard backup. So a lot of things happen, and you just have to be really on your feet and prepared for these things, especially when you sort of, I mean, I don't know, I, I feel like I often have like this sort of bubble that's surrounding me, uh, and you don't realize, you're, realize that you're in this bubble until sort of something happens uh, in the sense that I'm like, coming to college here and then I go into Jordan and it's all like exploration and it's it's incredible and something happens you're like okay this is actually real you know um, and so you just have to when you're in like foreign circumstances many other Apple other Apple fellows have been you know you just have to be prepared to change uh, quite often <laughs> that's Hi, my name's Thomas, and um, I was just wondering, what was the balance, and this can be for whoever wants to take it, what was the balance between um, your, like, having a plan for your trip and spontaneity? How much of it was, like, did it go, like this was kind of briefly talked about, but how much of it went according to plan, and how much of um, your final project ended up just kind of happening from spontaneous interactions and stuff like that? Thank you. Um, so the only planned part of my trip was Hawaii. Um, for that for that part of my trip, I had previously um, been in contact with a woman named Martha, who um, is a six-year-old woman who's like the only who's the owner of the only Latin American market in all of Hawaii. So that part was planned. It was amazing when everything went according to plan. It was perfect way to start my trip. Um, and then, as I mentioned, everything changed in New York, which is my next stop. Um, but that was, I mean, that was basically it. In New York and Chicago, I was l quite literally walking the streets and going into every, every um, business um, with that had like a Latino name to it. Um, and um, people on the street, people on the subway going up to them. Um, luckily, I didn't get into any real trouble. Um, people were very polite in telling me to go away. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, like, it, was, it was absolutely worth it. And, um, and you know, day, it, was, it was tough in Chicago. Chicago was nicer weather, but, um, but New York was, was hot. <laughs> and walking the streets, um, trying to find someone and you know, trying to keep spirits up was, um, was definitely a challenge. So, um, so yeah, I think a third, a quarter of my trip went according to plan, and everything else happened as it did, so. Um, during my, so I went straight to China from India. Um, I actually had to change my flight within like half an hour, or I would have been deported. 
but um, I had I luckily was talking to two different vendors in two different cities, so I had a second contact in the city that I had to change to. But the angle that I was trying to take, I made a documentary, so it was more visual. But the angle I was trying to take was um, like comparing a good vendor versus a bad vendor, and like a lot of vendors in China just take shortcuts and things like that. But I actually ended up talking to someone who's doing really good work in terms of getting good products to people. So you kind of just have to be flexible and go with the flow, and it may change your end product, but it's still good as long as you put in the work to make it good. Um, I think I'm a little bit on the different side of the spectrum because before I left for my trip, I had a day by day and almost hour by hour itinerary, which um, means inevitably things did not go to plan and there were, s there were a couple days in there that were spontaneous and that didn't have anything written down. Um, but I think being able for myself to see my schedule or schedule and um, just be like, you know what, that's not happening today was super, it was a growing point for me because as someone who really likes to have everything planned to just like learning to go with the flow and some things happen and you just got to adapt and continue. There's not really much you could do. And I think that like learning how to just go with the flow in that aspect translated so much over to the work I was doing, interviewing all the runners. And I just saw the correlation so nicely. Hi, my name is Marissa. Um, what is the single biggest piece of advice that you would give to younger students in the room? It's aimed at everyone. To me. Everyone. <laughs> I can go. Um, I think the single biggest piece of advice is to not make a plan and just see where, um, like if you told me a year ago today that I would be on this stage and that all of this would have happened, I would have laughed. If you told me five years ago I would be in California for college, I would have laughed. And I think just being really open-minded to all these separate opportunities that you have and um, just keep going and don't question too much where you are now and um, look, look forward and, and don't, don't dwell on things that you don't get and just be excited about what you do. Um, I think my biggest piece of advice is twofold. Firstly, um, trust your gut. I mean, trust that whatever decisions you're making for yourself are the correct ones. And secondly, trust your voice, especially in a lot of like the writing that you're going to do or whatever um, other media medium um, you're going to kind of craft your project in. Like, trust your voice, trust your vision for the project. Um, even if it departs from what you had in mind for it, what will come out is something that is uniquely yours and reflective of your experiences. I would say that it's really great to be open and to be prepared for things to go wrong because if you expect everything to go right, that's just overshooting by a lot. Um, I think that if you're op if you're open to new like to making new friends, to making new experiences in a new like a new country, new culture, or even just a different state, like just pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone is what I had to do, and I think that's how I got most of my success. Um, my advice is to be creative and to love what you do. Doing what you love doesn't have to be related at all to your major. And I got kind of stuck with that when I was brainstorming Apple ideas. You, you don't have to write about Gov for the Apple project. You can just talk about something that you're so deeply and immensely interested in. And that's, that's what makes the experience magical. Um. I would say to also step outside of your comfort zone. Um, literally, go outside. Um, it's pretty sick. Um, <laughs> but also, like, let yourself be scared and get over it and learn from that experience and um, allow yourself to be vulnerable. And um, yeah, get outside. Um, I think. Mine is almost a combination of Serena and Maddie's, but one, take the leap, get out of your comfort zone. I like to live in a little box and follow plans step by step, so forcing yourself out of the comfort zone is a really good thing, and I think that all of us did that in our projects, and it made, it made all of our projects better for it. And then also at the same time, take the opportunity to explore things that 
aren't like are, are kind of side interests almost, right? So I'm, I'm a GovEcon major and my, this project was about Filipino American history. It was something that's very much like kind of off the beaten track for me usually from what I do in class. And so it ended up just being something that I was very, very passionate about, even though it's not something that I'll probably end up like continuing on taking classes here necessarily. Um, for me, like, yes, step out of your comfort zone, but it's rough out there. <laughs> so for me, it's like once you've removed yourself from the situation, you're back home, everything's done, you will forget about the uncomfortable parts, and then you'll just have more time to reflect on the things that are really impactful and that you really cared about. So I would say, like, double reflect after it's finished because you'll get so much more out of it. Hey y'all, I would say use your resources, specifically the Center for Writing and Public Discourse. They helped a lot with my application and with my writing when I came back. Professor Crockett is awesome. Your Apple advisor should be awesome. And they can also help you a lot with editing your work, specifically when it comes to the writing process is the advice that I have. And feel free to send a million drafts to them. They will most likely get back to you and it's very helpful to have them. And also use your friends too, and other people in your life to help with your writing. Okay, I would say my advice would be, don't forget to have fun while you're doing your like project as well. Like, yes, it's very like, you wanna get it done, especially since it's like a school thing and you're like, oh, like I have this goal in mind, but don't forget to like, take those few days of like, let me try something else. Let me explore this part of like, Chicago I haven't been to, let me explore this part of like, the world, whatever area you're in, just like don't forget to like have fun and like that like that's a good way of re-energizing yourself and like getting back to your project. Um, I would say to kind of talk to and in the safest way possible, talk to anyone and everyone who will talk to you. Um, I learned so much that way, and I kind of got to that conclusion um, through a little bit of desperation, again, in New York. But um, at the same time, in, sh in Chicago, that, helped me s that mentality helped me so much. And, um, and I mean, I got over my fear of rejection very quickly. Um, and it was all about um, finding that one person who would be willing to talk to me, hearing their story. Um, and, and everyone just, Every, every, every single person has an amazing story. Um, and, and once you hear it, I mean, you're, be you're better for it. Um, and in, in a way, um, you're, for me, it was really important to let these people know that their stories mattered. Um, and for a lot of them, they expressed that, you know, they, they were able to share something that they normally don't get to. So in a way, it's, um, it's a very human, um, it's, I mean, it's, talking to people is the most human thing you can do. So I think, um, I think for me, at least, that was, that was the most special part of my project. So everyone basically summed it up already, but like, I, like it's been repeated, expect the unexpected. Depending on your project, like you're gonna be tested in all kinds of limits that you can't even think of. Um, so yeah, you don't always know what's gonna happen, but like that's okay. That's what like makes you push through the, like those times and like figuring it out. Like that's the whole part of life. So this is kind of just like a mini representation of that, and it's, it's such a like unique experience because of that. All right, I think on that note we should wrap up because we're out of time. But please join me in thanking our Apple Fellows.